invitation to be here once again. Thank your pastors, your leadership, and each one of you. Uh, it's a privilege to be here to share something from the Word of God uh, with us this, uh, this morning. And I'm really, really, uh, really, really honored uh, to be here. This morning, uh, Sister Sammy, is it? Sammy, uh, okay, good. Neither Ying Wen Hen Hao Lo. If I were your teacher, I'll give you A. Plus. Hen Hao, your English. I say her English is very good. If I was a teacher, I'd give her A. Plus already. Praise God. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Okay, this morning, I'd like to share with us um, the topic is um, from barrenness to fruitfulness. We will look at the life of uh, Hannah in the, gospel, uh, in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Most of it is 1 Samuel chapter 1. I hope you can go back and read chapter 2 and uh, chapter 3. Uh, Samuel is a well, very well known uh, woman in the Old Testament in the Bible. And her song of, exalt, of, of uh, worship, uh, exalting God and thanksgiving to God and gratitude to God is found in chapter 2, in chapter 2, verses 1 to uh, verses 10. And uh, <clears throat> in the Gospels, uh, I think it's in Luke, when Mary uh, conceived, when Mary conceived, she quoted certain words from Hannah's song of gratitude and thanksgiving to God. So Hannah's uh, song in chapter 2 has become the Word of God to us. It has become Scripture to, to us. Out of her suffering, out of her barrenness, her ordeal, her painful uh, circumstances, and her, her learning to and discovering God and finding God in her life and experiencing the goodness of God in her life, this song came out in chapter 2. Uh, now, in, uh, we will just uh, look at chapter 1. I hope you are familiar with the story. Uh, in verse 1, uh, we will read some verses and then we will pray. Now, there was a certain man of Ramathim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, Jeroham the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. And he had two wives. Now, this doesn't apply to us today, of course. Okay, just in case. Huh? The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina sounds like Pirana. Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Now, this clause is inserted uh, about uh, the sons of Eli because you will find a further description of the sons of Eli in chapter 2, verse 11 onwards, that they are corrupted, they were immoral sexually, uh, sexual immoral, immorality, they practiced it, and they were actually stealing from God's sacrifices for themselves. So they were very corrupted. So this account of Hannah's life took place in the midst of the situation where the priests, the priests in the temple were corrupted, you see. All right. so, it was a very, so there was a spiritual decadence in the, in the temple uh, at that time. And so, in verse 4, And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion. Uh, take note of this. For he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb and her rival. Now, Penina is being described as a rival. A rival... This is like a Korean movie already. Eh? Her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year 
when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she, uh, Penina, provoked her. Therefore, she, she that is uh, Hannah, wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Take note of this. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon he said, meaning that he will be consecrated as a priest to the Lord. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman or a loose woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked him. And she said, Let your maid's servant find favour in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then she rose early in the morning, worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to the house of Ramah, where they lived, and Elkanah knew Hannah, meaning that Elkanah had sex with her, and his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Behold, I have asked him, asked for him from the Lord. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to, the, to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls, one ephah of flour and a skin of wine. To offer three bulls, that means they are quite well-to-do, it's quite a well-to-do family. And brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young, he's a few years old. Then they slaughtered a bull, and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent, granted actually to the Lord. So they worshipped the Lord there. Take note also in verse 19 where Hannah worshipped the Lord before the Lord answered her prayer. And at the end in verse 28, Hannah worshipped the Lord after the Lord answered her prayer. Now in this story of Hannah, we find that uh, in the Old Testament, according to the Mosaic law, 
when a person is uh, barren, cannot give birth to child, that means they have been cursed under the law. They are not fruitful, you see. Because under the covenant of Israel with God, when in the, the covenant relationship with God, they are supposed to experience the blessings of God and, the, uh, uh, and their land experiencing abundance and fruitfulness and uh, uh, many, many children and, and things like this, you see. So being barren was a reproach uh, to Hannah because, of course, people in that co community will talk bad about her and will despise her and look down upon her. So the person with power in the house and the community was Penina because Penina is seen as a woman who is blessed. Penina is seen as a person whom God is with her because she's blessed. She got many, many children, you see. So when a person is in, in that position like uh, Penina, she's in a position of power, you see. She's in a position of control. So she has got control, she has got power, and she has got influence. You know. So you bet that Penina has been gossiping around the community, especially to the women who love to hear gossip stories. And so Penina would have been gossiping and running down Hannah until uh, she's not worth half a cent anymore. You know? So Penina was the kind of a woman. So she, she was her rival. She gave Hannah such a hard time, you see. So Hannah was so deeply wounded, she became, she was, a, she says, she's of sorrowful spirit. She has poured out her soul. She has been so grieved and complaining to God. She's in bitterness of soul, verse 10, and she's, uh, she wept in anguish. And so like Hannah, Many of us, maybe in the past or present, we may experience or be in a situation where we have been, we have been wounded. We have been wounded uh, by our bosses, our loved ones, our family members, maybe brothers and sisters uh, around us. We have been wounded in all kinds of situations. And, um, and because of this, we find that, like Hannah, even the people close to Hannah, like her husband, was no help to Hannah. Is it? And so, all Hannah could do was weep and weep and weep. And so, when we have been grieved and wounded and disappointed, and things have not worked out the way we expect uh, things to work out, like Hannah, we need to come before God. The only place where we can turn to is the Lord. You see. We don't understand why God allows uh, a person like Hannah or even us to be in situations of inju injustice, unfairness, uh, and uh, <clears throat> all kinds of uh, bad things uh, happen to us and being mistreated and in painful circumstances uh, of loss, etc. And one of the reasons why these things happen is because we live in a fallen world. No matter how triumphant we uh, claim the victory of Jesus, there are situations like this in our life. So victory doesn't mean that the situation around us externally is in perfect peace and harmony with our expectations. Victory in Jesus does not mean that everything will go well all the time in our life. Sometimes when you come to the traffic light, it will turn red. It doesn't turn green all the time just because the Christian is kind of coming up the road. Just now we were driving down from the Saramban Highway. There was at least two kilometers long of uh, army vehicles, you know, big army vehicles, I've never seen them, and military police on the center of the road. You know, it was a very, very long, I thought, I. Uh, Finish, like, we're going to be very, very late already, you know. And there was a long traffic queue behind the army vehicle. It was very, very long stretch, huge vehicles. We couldn't pass the fast lane because they were occupying the middle lane and the fast lane, you know. So all the vehicles were stuck. So I thought, oh, yo, why they are doing this on such a day? So even though I'm coming to preach in uh, assembly, life assembly here, it doesn't mean that the road will be so smooth, you see. You know what I mean? So life is not always smooth. 
you know, we are Chinese, we hope uh, the road is always smooth, you know. But it's not always yat lo sun fung. Sometimes uh, yat lo tai fung also. Sometimes it's not all the way smooth and easy, but sometimes all the way can be stormy as well, you see. You know what I mean? So, so for Hannah, life was rock bottom at this point in her life. And it was very, very difficult. You know? Now, sometimes Christians, uh, we, we may have wounded people, or people may have wounded us. You know? What is very important, as we see in Hannah's life, is whatever wounds happened to us in the past, whatever wrong or injustices people did to us, whether it's now or in the past, we have to settle our accounts uh, with God. We have to settle our past accounts with God. The Christian attitude, the wrong attitude, is to think that, uh, forget about the past, even Paul says, I'm forgetting all things behind me and pressing forward towards the mark and goal. Yes, we press forward. We can only press forward and move forward after the, the past accounts has been settled in our hearts. So we cannot gloss over injustices that we have done to people, wrong that we have done to people, and then just ignore it, bury it, suppress it, and then just say, I have to move forward and look forward. The Christian life, if you read Psalms 136 and 107, you find that Israel, uh, the Psalms there in the Bible, talks about the past, the historical journey of Israel. God reminds them of their time in Egypt, in the wilderness, in the promised land, etc., to remind them of God's past actions because they were walking rightly with God. And to also to remind them that the calamities that happened to them, the painful experiences of being conquered by other nations happened to them because of their rebelliousness against the Word of God and their disobedience towards God. So looking to the past would help Israel to move forward, you see. So in the Christian, it's also, Christian life, it's also like this. We have to look back to the past, make sure that our accounts with people in the past, whom we have wounded, whom we have uh, done whatever th things that we have done, disappointed them, or they have disappointed us, we have to make sure while we are praying now in the presence of God, that those accounts are settled. So a clean account in the heart before God will prepare the spiritual ground inside our heart for God to move in our lives now. We don't want God, you don't expect God to move and build on top of this ground that is full of holes. Isn't it? We don't want God, we don't want to build a house where the ground, uh, the foundation, the ground, inside ground is full of holes. There will be sinkholes in a short time. So in our spiritual life, it's the same. So settling past accounts, sometimes we have to go to the person face to face and apologize, ask for forgiveness. Whether the person responds properly or not, it's up to them. You don't have to, we, you don't have to keep talking to the person for the rest of your life. But there are some times, like in Hannah's case, both women were staying in the same house, but their relationship was irreconcilable. There was a huge gulf between their relationship, between Hannah and Penina. I don't think they talked to each other. Can you please pass me that piece of egg? I think Penina will just throw the egg in her face. It was so bad. So every time you just imagine when the husband gives Hannah double portion, you can imagine Penina staring at her, glaring at her, you know, giving her a hard time. Have you seen people like that? You know? The way they look at you can kill you already. They don't have to say anything. You know? One look only, you see. That's how powerful this Pirana is. Penina is, you see. In fact, her name should be P P uh, Pirana, you know? you know. I think the Pirana, you throw inside the Pirana tank, the Piranas will die also. Some people are like this. They have all the power, all the favor, all the blessings, and they double down on others. Hannah is already barren, having a terribly hard time. And she chanke, you know, 
take the opportunity uh, to press her down until uh, she's already on the ground to make sure that she go underneath the ground. Don't want to see her anymore. So some people are terribly wicked, you know. You know what I mean? And even though uh, Penina also goes to the temple in Shiloh, she also prays. She was a religious person. She prays, but no change. She prays. She talks to God. She offers sacrifices. She's a religious person, but no change. Her life is not transformed, you see. It's, whether it's a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian, it can happen to all of us. We can be religious on the outside, but there's no change on the inside. How do we know the way we treat others when we, are, have, we have an upper hand, when we have a position of power, we are rich, we are well-to-do, we are in control, we are in charge, we have authority, we have wealth, we have connections. How we treat people says a lot about our relationship with God and our prayer life. So in our prayer life, we have to bring our heart before God and examine it in the presence of God and allow God to search our hearts like David says in Psalms 139, search my heart, O God. A person who is concerned like David, who is concerned about being close to God, walking rightly before God, and wants to walk with God, and wants God to walk with him, will be very concerned about having the heart searched by God every day. Unless God searches your heart, and you, are, you want God to search your heart, because you want to have a clean heart, you want to have a clean heart, you want to have a spiritual ground inside your heart that has got no lobang, lobang, lobang. No termite mounds there. No rotting wombs inside. You want to get it out. Get it cleansed. So that the Spirit of God can dwell in you deeply and fill you, satisfy you, fill your hearts, even though you don't have the latest iPhone. And everybody is flashing one around in your face. You don't even need it to have an identity, to find meaning, to find purpose, to know who you are in God. And so Hannah went through such a horrible time, a horrible nightmare, where, like Hannah, when we are in such a place, the only place we can go to, the only place left in this entire universe for Hannah, when we see in the scripture, and this happens to us, the only place left is God. Bolo Hangjo. No other road, no other jalan already. So Hannah reached this point in her life, and this will happen to us. We cannot look to our friends. We cannot depend on Twitter. We cannot depend on conglomerates, big companies, connections. Powerful friends, up there, down there, sideways, can't connect. You cannot depend on all these people. It'll be a mistake, a loss to us in the future down the road. If now we are dependent on people more than on God. You see. And so God allows us to come to a place where the only recourse, the only road left is God Himself. And that is a good thing when you are down the only road is God, that means God is working on your case. If He's not on your case, it's terrible. Life is too smooth. You better worry when life is too smooth. All the time. Baskin Robbins. It's not Baskin Robbins all the time. It's, we are always trying to live our life in such a way that we want to protect ourselves from suffering, from hardship. We want to protect ourselves from things going wrong and, not, not, and things are not going according to our expectations and the way we want things to go, is it? So the, our, our prayer life, held in our prayer life, we surrender to God our expectations and the, uh, our expectations of how we want things to go according to our desires. Sometimes God grants us the desires of our heart and he, he, he answers our prayer. And He often does. But sometimes, it doesn't work that way, is it? It doesn't happen all the time. 
And it doesn't mean when it doesn't happen that you are not victorious. It doesn't mean you are defeated, you see. It doesn't mean God is absent, you see. God is present, but He's doing something else in, the, in your radar which you can't see, you see. He's doing something else in our life. And so sometimes when these things happen, it's because God is teaching us that though we don't see Him answering the prayer, He's still there. Like the song says, even though you don't see Him, He's still working. You see. Even easy to sing, isn't it? But when you are in the mud, in a deep pit, and it's happening to you like Hannah, like that, very hard to sing, I tell you. Even for me, also very hard to sing. But He's working, He's present, and He's teaching us that He's present, and He can be found. And He's using, He will use our affliction uh, to deepen our relationship with Him, to deepen that knowledge of Him, to deepen that walk, to deepen that trust, to deepen that union, deepen that intimacy, deepen that communion with God. So that in life, so that we know deep inside our hearts that we need God more than anything else in our life. So that we, having tasted that union deeply in times of affliction, we know that the one thing, the most important thing in this universe, in my universe, that I must have is a union, a closeness, a close proximity with God in my life. Because circumstances can change. They are very volatile. I cannot control my circumstances. I cannot control e economic situations. I cannot control the government department. I cannot control what's going to ha happen in my life. But if I walk closely with God, circumstances can change. They are fluid. They are volatile. They are stormy. They are turbulent. But the one who can take me through those turbulence is God. And He will take me through. I will go through painful moments. It will be hard. It will be difficult. But I will make it. I will come through a better person, deeper person, more stable person, stronger person, a more wholesome person, more beautiful person also. But very few Christians want to take this road. They want a, ro a road full of roses. They're always expecting that and they think that is victory. It is not victory. It's a false gospel. It's a false Christianity. You see this a lot in YouTube today. After being a Christian for 40 years, I begin to discover so much of what I've been teaching, thinking about the Christian life, most of it was so wrong. Anyway, that's another story. And so for Hannah, the only place was to go to God. And when we go to God, uh, we must go to God, learn to go to God deeply, like Hannah. So Hannah has a lot to teach us about going deeply into God. So how does God help us in this? He helps us by allowing us to go through painful moments in our life. Disappointments, sometimes betrayal, failed expectations. Things didn't happen according to my, the way that I hoped that it would happen. God didn't answer my prayer according to my expectations and desires. I mustn't lose hope when that happens. Don't be so, don't give up so easily. You see. Don't take the easy route because what you want is God. So in our Christian life, I was sharing last Sunday, in our relationship with God, it's not about getting close to God so that God will give me the things that I want. It's a wrong concept, a wrong picture of our relationship with God. If I get close to God, I'll do anything God says, I'll come to church, I'll clean the toilets so that God will answer my prayer, and give me the things that I want, the big things, the main things, that's the most important thing, so that God will do that. Then if I do that, if my relationship is based on that understanding, that means uh, my needs, me, is I'm in the center. It's not Jesus. Jesus is just a means. 
My relationship with God is utilitarian. I will use Him. I'll be so nice to Him. You know some people are like this. They're so nice to you because they want something from you. We will do the same to God. In a very spiritual way, lah, of course. Because we know how to hide, you see. We know how to look spiritual, talk spiritual, behave spiritual, look like a Christian, like a hamster face like that. When we come to pray, we show God a hamster face, you see. Hamsters are very cute, you know. So we got hamster face Christian. But God doesn't look at the hamster face. He sees right into the heart. So we cannot pian yeso. Cannot tipu him, you see. We cannot say all kinds of things. And so, for Hannah, we find that during those most painful moments, what is happening is this. God, the more painful, the more failed expectations we go through, God is teaching us that at the centre of your life and mine is Him. It's His will for you. It's His purpose for you. His direction for your life. It's His plans for you. It's His aim for you. Now the question at that point in your life, you and I need to ask is this. Can I trust that God has got much better plans, desires, purpose for me uh, without any deceit in His heart? Or we sing the song uh, that all the ways of God uh, are just. You know? I had these thoughts in my life many times when things didn't go the way I expected. Uh, and my expectations collapsed to pieces. I was so disappointed many, many times by people around me whom I work with, uh, even in the church. And I wondered whether God was playing around with me. You know. As a human being, we feel that, you see. Even though we know in our mind that God isn't like this. So God had to speak to me. Uh, when He speaks to us, whatever way He work He does in our life, there is no duplicity in Him because He is perfectly holy. He is not just perfectly loving. His love uh, is perfectly holy. That means there is not a tinge of evil, unkindness, deceitfulness, or biasness towards us. Perfect in His plan. Like a loving father. Is it? Now, our human experience of God doesn't make us think that way or feel that way because our circumstances is controlling, our negative circumstances is controlling the way we feel about God, the way we think, the way we look to God. Is it? So our picture of God is not very rosy during difficult times. Is it? That's why we have to come to the Word of God and allow the Word of God to speak to us. We have to learn to read the Word of God and read, read the Word of God, not, not read all the YouTube victory, victory, victory into the Bible and then allow that to interpret the Bible for us. That's not God. That's not the voice of God, you see. You have to obliterate those things, come to the Word of God and let God in the Word speak to you like, no, like there's no biasness there. We tr complete openness and you have to learn to listen with your heart, is it? And so, and so for Hannah, the more painful, the more difficult the situations, what God does is that He uses these painful circumstances to create an open ground, to open the depths of the heart. It's as if to peel off the ground, to peel off the ground, our self-nature, our self-will, our wrong expectations, things that are centered on us. God wants to peel off this ground Tear it apart. You just imagine uh, someone comes, incredible Hulk comes into the hall uh, and tears the whole floor uh, one feet deep and tear it off just like that. And so painful moments, God used those things to remove this surface layer from our lives so that He can open the ground of the heart, open it up and create an openness inside us. You see. But it doesn't happen so easily the way we read in Hannah's account. During this painful moment, Hannah was driven towards God. And the more painful her circumstances were, the, the intensity, the need for God became deeper and became stronger because there's no other solution. 
There is no other solution. So she was driven to God deeply. She couldn't even utter her prayers. Her tears became her words. She had no words. Her tears became her words, you see. And sometimes all you can do is sit there and weep. There's no words. Hannah could not articulate the bitterness of her soul. She couldn't find the words. She cannot think clearly even. All she can do is just weep. You know. That's the most powerful type of prayer, more powerful than praying in tongues. Because it comes uh, from the depth of your heart. We can pray in tongues, very shallow one, uh, very mechanical. You see. But when you weep and your tears become your prayer, it comes from a deepest level uh, of your soul, of your being. Uh. That's why Revelation says that God put our tears in the bottle. He doesn't put our praying in tongues in a bottle. But He'll put your tears uh, in a bottle. Uh, because it's so precious. You see. And every teardrop has got words inside uh, that only God can hear. You see. When He looks at the teardrop, He can hear the pain uh, in every teardrop. You see. Only God can hear that. And so Hannah came to such a place and she was driven towards God. You know. As she poured out, the Bible says she poured out her soul, meaning that she poured out uh, not just her tears you know, and her pain, she was pouring out uh, her whole life to God. She said in verse 15, uh, I have poured out my soul. That means uh, in the Old Testament, the soul is your whole being. The ho it's not just your soul, it also is a, way, a Hebrew way of saying, my whole life, I poured it out to God. Affliction does that to us. So those painful experiences are powerful moments in our life to encounter God and for God to step into our lives and change us, even change the direction, the course of our career, the course of our life, our human existence. And so during this particular point in Hannah's life, what Hannah did was, at this point in her life, we see her, her resoluteness uh, to stay with God until uh, the end, until God came through, until she could eat, until her countenance changed, until, in verse 19, she could worship God. You see. So she stayed until the end. So you can pray and pray and pray and never come to an end. You know. During this particular moment in time, what God intends is that you will pray and pray and pray and pray and find that there's no answer. God is withholding the answer because He's waiting and wanting to see us come to an end of ourselves where when we reach that end of ourselves, inside our hearts, when we come to an end of ourselves, we come to a place where we have got nothing inside us to offer God. Nothing. Your talent means nothing. Your spiritual gifts mean nothing. Your wealth, your resources, what you can do with your left hand, your right hand, your left leg, your right leg means nothing to God. Nothing. When, you, you, when God brings you to that place, that is your strongest moment in your spiritual life. It's not when what I have, what I can do, I can do, I can do, you know. God don't want to hear all this, I can do, I can do, I want to do, I want to do, I want to do. God never asks you to do. You are doing things for Him that is not in His plans. You may have good intention. Good intention doesn't mean that it's God's plan. Good intention is your plan. It's not God's plan. So you have to be very careful that you have to ask God, God, show us your way. What, like Paul on the road of Damascus, what do you want, you want me to do, Lord? That is the agenda. You see. God, I, it's not, the agenda is not, God, I want to do this for you. I want to start this for you. I want to do this for you. 
this is what a church should be, this is what a Christian should be, this is what the Bible says. No, 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 the Bible says many, many things. There are many things we can do, you see. But God, what do you want to do? That is the agenda, you see. What do you have for me, you see? What is your will? What is your direction, you see? We are here to follow, not take the lead. It's not Jesus following us. It's we follow Jesus. And so God has to bring us to that place where, like Hannah, everything comes to an end. And she came into the place where, she came, comes into a place where, inside her being, she's as good as dead. As good as dead. Lifeless. Hopeless. It's like now, uh, the feeling, God, you, it's all up to you. Now, we don't even demand, you know. We don't even expect. We don't even claim. We don't even declare. We come to a place where we say, in our heart, uh, rock bottom, God, it's up to you now, Lord. At this point, we feel like giving up. We feel like throwing the towel. We feel like saying, uh, God, it's useless, like, it's no point. That's a very powerful moment, is it? Because that is the place, precisely the place where God is waiting for you. When you have got nothing left, you have reached the end. That is precisely the place where God is going to act, is it? It is precisely the place where God wants us to, to come to because that is the place at the point of death the Spirit of God works. At the point of death, the Holy Spirit comes alive in the thing that has died. Now, many Christians don't understand this. So, they use their street wiseness to find God's direction, find a way out. You see. So, you must understand what God is trying to do in your life when He brings things to an end. John chapter 12, verse 24 says, Jesus says, uh, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone, unfruitful. But if, if it dies, it brings forth or produces much grain or much fruit. You see. If it dies, it produces. Very strange. It doesn't say if it dies, it dies. The world thinks like this. People will try do, to do this to you. If you die, you die. But Jesus on the other hand, says this, you know, if it dies, uh, it produces. The Christian life is the paradox. It's like a contradiction. It's out of the place of your coming to an end of yourself, your place of loss, your place of grief, your place of hopelessness, your place of despair, and your place of, of meaninglessness and emptiness as you come before God, out of if it dies, it produces, is it? So what God teaches, is one of the most basic things in the Christian life is this. You know, this is a very, very important central truth in the Christian life and that is this. Out of death comes life. Out of death comes life. And this dying experience is the mark, the central mark of the Christian life. Not spiritual gifts. Not prophetic anointing. Not prophetic ministry either. All those things are secondary. They are not central. They are not primary components. You know. They are secondary. So you don't take what is secondary uh, and make it central. If you do that, you are kicking, kicking the cross away. Because the cross, the mark of the cross is following Jesus and knowing the seasons where I have to die and the daily experience of putting the flesh to death. That is the mark of the cross, the Christian life. Not spiritual gifts, prophetic anointing. I grew up in a church where it is so prophetic, you cannot even imagine. It's the most prophetic church I have ever seen and experienced. Uh, I cannot even see one prophetic church today that is half like that. And we planted many, many, many churches, raised up our own workers, you see. Very prophetic. 
People came from England, Australia, they will record our worship services because there will be a few women there singing in the spirit. Uh, they sang in the spirit solo, you know, until the, you can feel the heaviness of God's presence descending. Uh, and most people will be weeping uh, on the floors. Uh, and then there will be very powerful prophecies. You know, very, very prophetic. You know. So we, we inherited that, some of that uh, in my in our, our life, you see, those who came from that, that movement. You see. Unfortunately, that movement has gone down, downhill already, died already. You see. Very, very sad. Eh? And so, afflictions, when Hannah came to such a place, God uses this to teach us how to, to teach us the way to pray, the spirit of prayer, in Hannah's life, which is total abandonment to God, pouring out the whole life and soul to God. And out of that, the second thing God teaches is how to give. How to give of ourselves. How to give of our Samuels. Samuel is a gift of God by the Spirit of God birthed into Hannah's life. Is it? But Hannah can give that back to God. You know, many Christians, they think that when God gives them a ministry, they think that, oh, this is my ministry. My cousin who used to work in uh, NECF told me when they have intercession, intercessors conference, uh, some of the intercessors from churches, they come into the meeting, uh, they walk in like VIP, uh, like young Ahmad Barhomat, uh, walk right to the front of the church there uh, and expect to sit in the front. They think that they are Celebrity uh, and YB already. Because, and then uh, the ushers tell them, there's no more seats. She said, I'm an intercessor. It, that spirit uh, is totally con contradictory uh, to the spirit of the gospel. That's why the problem is this. You know, if we do not experience and know, John chapter 12, verse 20, unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground, if it dies, you have to die eh, to all of your desire to be recognized. Your self-importance. How you think people should treat you because of your so-called prophetic anointing, your ministry, your suffering, your leadership position, who you are. You have to die to all that. Jesus was the Son of God. Did he claim anything like this? Did he? Did he ever say, how can you treat me like this? I'm the son of God, no. I got no sin, you got sin. No. That's a problem, is it? We don't realize that we are still sinful. Even though we claim all the victory and the power. I am an intercessor. Wow, wow. The, the ushers in the conference got a shock. So powerful, more powerful than the Holy Spirit. That kind of Christianity uh, is saying it already. Because there's no humility. You see. Humility uh, is a mark of the cross. You see. If we don't have this, uh, everything is altar, it's counterfeit. We can have anointing and spiritual gift. We can prophesy, uh, but without humility at the core, front, center, and back, uh, then what we have is a counterfeit. We will become what, like what, you know, the Corinthian church Christians. You can go back and read about the Corinthian church. So much, they have all the gifts, all the knowledge, they've got everything. One big important thing that they, they don't have was this the dying life. John 12, unless a corn of wheat, if it dies, it produces much fruit. So Paul puts it in another way. In 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 2, he says, when I came to you, I determined not to know your church attendance, your social work, your numbers, your children ministry, your missions department. I determined to know nothing about all these things. I don't care about all these things. I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. That's all. That was the only thing that Paul was. One thing. Because if you have that one thing right, all the other things, spiritual gifts, 
prophecy, anointing, visions, dreams, they all will fall into place on their proper place. They won't usurp the place where Jesus is Lord. You see. And so Hannah's life, and let me close with this. Hannah made a vow. And in verse 19 tells us that she worshipped the Lord. She worshipped the Lord before the Lord answered her prayer. She worshipped, she poured out her soul, and when she poured out her soul, she put worship on that ground. I've given my whole life to God. Now I'm so free to worship God. I don't care if God doesn't give me a son, God doesn't answer my prayer, but the Bible tells us in a process of time, it wasn't even immediate, she doesn't even know if God will ever answer the prayer. But she worshipped, her life became a life of worship before the results came. So much so that the results and the expectation and desire for her son no longer becomes the determining centre in her heart, in her life. She's free. She's not a captive to her expectations. You see. That's why she could worship. She's no longer a captive. She's not held in ransom by my, I must have a son. I must have a son. You must answer my prayer. You must give me this. You must do this. You see. She's no longer a captive to that desire. You see. That's what it means by she poured out her life. And because of this, when God finally gave her a son, she could give Samuel up to God all the days of her li his life. It's the worst time to give a four-year-old, five-year-old child uh, and send it to the temple when the youth pastor is corrupted and living in sin. It's the worst time. Hannah could have used the corruption of Hophni and Phinehas and said, God, God, you know, my son is so like a child. She's so vulnerable at this stage. You know, I don't want my son to be influenced by all this corruption. These priests, the youth pastors, they are also corrupted. They are bad example. God, when the time is right, I will give my son. If most Christians in their situation, most mothers would probably say this. It's hard to give everything to God after God has given you everything you want. So when people are rock bottom, either bankrupt, business not doing well, etc., etc., they will come to church every day. One. They can clean the toilet, they can sweep the floor, they can do anything. They will want to see the pastor three times a day. They will come every day to church. You don't even have to call them, they will come. Because they got nothing already at the bottom. Mm. So Hannah kept her vow. You know. She didn't give Samuel to the temple, uh, for three days a week or just for two years part-time, temporary casual worker and then take him back after that. All the days of his life. So Hannah gave everything to God. So what do we see here is this. It's not... So God came through, answered Hannah's prayer, removed the reproach in Hannah's life. It's a great thing, but it's not about Hannah. It's about God's purpose. God came through in Hannah's life and what God gave to Hannah was needed for the community and the nation of Israel. It's not just healing, solving Hannah's problem alone. So we are very self-centered if we think that God, you must do this to solve me, my problem alone. You see. Remove this reproach, you see. That's why when you pour your soul out to God, it is like Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane saying to the Father, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. See. Then when God comes through, whatever He's going to do, however He's going to align you, whatever job, whatever career path, whoever you're going to marry, co connect to, whatever this, it, it's so that He can move in you and through you. You may touch a person's life and that person may touch 10 more or a 1,000 more. You don't know, you see. So it's no longer about you. It's not just your, your, your need or your reproach, you see. So Christianity is very wrong, very self-centered when we think that God, you have to give me this. You have to do this for, for my life. It's God, your will. It's not mine. So the way we pray has to be turned the other way around, you see. Then we will see, see God moving in our lives, uh, from nothingness, from unfruitfulness, 
from barrenness, from hopelessness, from a place of reproach, from a place of being nothing uh, to a place of fruitfulness. Uh, and fruitfulness is not measured by people in the church. It's not measured by people in the church. It's not measured even by leaders in the church. It's measured by God and God alone. How can a person who is a cleaner in the church be fruitful? She may not win thousands to God. She may not be able to sing. But she can be fruitful by holding a broom. She's faithful to do her service. The way she served God impresses God, not impresses you and me, you know. But the way she served God impresses God so much that God says that she is fruitful. But you and I cannot see, you see. We have wrong ideas of fruitfulness. We impose our ideas, secularized understanding of fruitfulness into the word fruitful in the Bible and then we are trying to tell God and interpret for God what He means by fruitfulness. So fruitfulness, yes, it sometimes involves numbers. Yes, there's healing. Yes, souls are won. Yes, many, many th he wonderful things can be done. Missions can be done. New works can be started. Yes, but those are not the only things. There's something more. See. There's something much, much more. See. And so in Hannah's life, we find that, i close this. I know I've gone beyond the time already. My wife is going to have, have a word to me in the car on the way back to KL about this. So the way she honoured her self-giving life to God is grounded in her relationship with God. Her giving of Samuel, the most painful, difficult thing, whether it's a career, it's a ministry, it's you, our pride, whatever it is, the most painful thing to God is grounded uh, in her relationship. She could give the thing most precious to her because she has given, poured out her life to God. And pouring out our life to God is a continuous thing. It's not a single moment, not a single event. It's a daily thing where we cultivate this self-giving, wholehearted giving, fully surrenderedness to God in our lives. Let's pray. Let's all stand. Just lift up your hands and put your hands together like this and then just uh, your palms open and then you just begin to say to God, God, my whole life is in this palm. My thoughts about my career path, my future, my family, my health, my children, what is going to happen to me at this age in my life, my financial worries, my business, is in all in this palm lot. Just say it to God right now. And I re recognize Lord Jesus, that you are everything in my life and everything to me. All I have comes from you. And all I have also belongs to you. Even my body, my desires, my possessions, my ability to work, my degrees, my training, my experience, my hopes, they all are yours, Lord Jesus. And I bring them up to you, Lord. I lift them up to you. My children, my family, my desires, Lord. I lift them up to you, Jesus. I lift them up to you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you are the God of my life and that, God, you own me and I'm yours, Lord. And all that I have is yours. And so today, Father, as I stand before your presence, I ask you to lead me, to show me your path, 
to lead me in your way, to take full control of my life and help me overcome my fears, the fear of trusting you, the fear of letting everything go and putting everything in your hands, Lord. Help me, Lord Jesus, to face these fears and to rise above them. Speak to my heart and show me, Lord Jesus. Lord, I want to fully trust you, surrender my life to you, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let us pray right now. I want to pray for the congregation. And Father, as we lift up, lifted up our hearts to you, you have seen our desires, you have seen our hearts, fears, concerns, our anxieties, and there are many, and you know them, Lord Jesus. And Father, I praise you and thank you that you can be found in the midst of our turmoil, turbulence, uncertainties. We are your God who is more present than the negative circumstances that surround us and fill us. You are more deeper in our lives. Help us, Lord Jesus, in this congregation. Show us, dear Lord, your goodness as well as your greatness. Help us to see your path, hear your voice, have knowledge of you and your desires for us. Bless this church, Lord. Pour the abundance of your grace and peace upon them. Let the ministry and the power of your Holy Spirit continue to flow, descend upon their midst as they pray for the sick, the captives, as they set them free, Lord Jesus. Let more and more signs and wonders and miracles take place in this church. Let them draw and cling to your cross, to your words, much, much more deeply, Lord, than ever before. In the name of Jesus, strengthen every heart, Lord. Let the fellowship of your Spirit, let the grace of God, the Father, descend upon us, fill our hearts with wisdom, enlighten our hearts, our minds, God, and strengthen us with your glory, with your power, Lord, with your presence, your fullness, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Let's give God a clap of praise for a wonderful message by Pastor Malcolm. Let's sing this song as we allow uh, close this meeting. Let's sing this song. And if you have any need, any prayer require that you require to be prayed for, come forward as the, okay, we sing the music, uh, worship team. Lead us into this song. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, I come to Heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I found in you. Amen. Lord, I come to know the weaknesses I see in me will be swept away. saw with you.
Father, we thank you for your message, Father. Truly, Lord, we want to surrender, commit our life once again to you, Father. Because you are good God, Father. Hallelujah. You are God who wash over our life. We will never outgive you, Lord. Hallelujah. We will always remember, as you have blessed us, we will always remember to bless you back, Father. Because you own everything of us. Father, we give you glory. We commit a, uh, our brother and sister to you, Father. Guide them, lead them, show them the way for the past next one week. Lord, hallelujah, guide their path. Direct their life. So that, Lord, their life will never be the same again, Father. Let, Lord, you bring us again to your house next week for another section with you, another encounter with you. We thank you. Blessed be your shalom. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray. Amen. God bless everyone. Of the goodness of God.